This is a Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast, a continuing of the reading of A Lifting Up of the Downcast. This chapter is A Lifting Up in the Lack of Assurance. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Psalm 42, verse 11. Sometimes the discouragements of God's people are drawn from the lack of their evidence for heaven. And so they reason or argue, I am a poor creature who lacks assurance of the love of God and of my own salvation. Therefore, I am so discouraged. Indeed, if I had any evidence of an interest in Christ, I should never be discouraged, whatever my condition were. But alas, I lack the assurance of God's love and of eternal life. Should I now die, I do not know whether I should go to heaven or hell. And what would become of my soul to all eternity? Oh, I lack assurance of my salvation, and therefore am so discouraged. Have I not just cause and reason for my discouragements now? No, no reason yet. It is indeed a great evil and a sore affliction to lack the assurance of God's love and of your own salvation. Yet notwithstanding the lack of this assurance, it is not sufficient ground or bottom for your discouragement. I confess it is a great evil and a sore affliction for a man to lack assurance, for sin and affliction are twisted together in the lack of assurance. As of all blessings, those are the greatest where grace and comfort are joined together. So where sin and affliction are twisted together, of all afflictions they are the most afflictive. And so it is a lack of assurance, for as in assurance there is something of grace and something of comfort or reward, So in the lack of assurance there is somewhat of sin or unbelief and somewhat of affliction too. Sin and affliction. Affliction and sin. They're both twisted together in the lack of assurance. The truth is, a man that lacks the assurance of God's love and of his interest in Christ is neither fit to receive mercy from God, nor to make return of love and praise to God as he should. Not fit to receive mercy as he should. For though he would have Christ come in, yet by unbelief he shuts the door against him, and he makes an evil interpretation of mercies offered to him. If a mercy or blessing be tendered to him, he says, this comes in judgment to me. It is a blessing indeed in itself, but I fear it is a judgment to me. So he makes an ill interpretation of blessings, and so is unfit to receive them. And he is not fit to make returns of love to God again. Assurance returns praise. And therefore the text here, O my soul, wait on God, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Why? For he is my God. Praise grows upon assurance. And upon this account I say he is neither fit to receive mercy, nor to make return of praise as he should. Further, He that lacks assurance of God's love converses too much with Satan, as he has the assurance of God's love, converses with Christ, the Spirit bearing witness to him that he is the child of God, so that he that lacks assurance converses with Satan, and Satan, though falsely, is still bearing witness to his Spirit that he is not the child of God. And is it not a misery to be in these converses with Satan? To be under his hellish droppings, David felt one pang of unbelief, and he cried out and said, It is too painful for me. Oh, what a pain is it, then, to lie bed rid of an unbelieving heart. You know a chaste and a loving wife counts it an affliction to her to be followed with the solicitations of an unworthy person, to suspect and be jealous of her husband's love. For, she says, He does therefore follow me with these solicitations, making me to suspect my husband's love, that so he may attain his own filthy desires. So says a gracious soul, the devil is always following and tempting me to suspect the love of Christ. And he does therefore do it, that he may attain his mind upon me. For the devil knows well enough that the more I suspect Christ's love, the more I shall embrace Satan's love. The truth is, beloved, this lack of assurance of God's love or interest in Christ is an inlet to many sins and miseries. For first, a man doubts of his own salvation, 
and after he has continued doubting, then he rises up to a full conclusion, saying, Now know I that Christ does not love me. I did but doubt before, but now I know he doesn't love me. And after he has risen to this conclusion, then shortly he rises higher and he goes further. Thus, if Christ does not love me now, he never will love me. And if I have no interest in Christ now, after all the preaching I have heard and ordinances enjoyed, if I don't have an interest in Christ now, I shall never have it. And so the longer I live, the more I aggravate my condemnation. Therefore, as good in hell at first as at the last. And therefore, now I will even make away with myself. Oh, what a black chain is here. And the first link is the lack of assurance. If you should see a child, a pretty child, lie in the open streets and none own it, would it not make your bowels yearn within you? Come to the little one and say, Child, where is your father? I don't know, the child says. Where is your mother, child? I don't know. Who is your father? What is your father's name, child? I don't know. Would it not make your heart ache to see such a little one in the streets? But for a poor soul to lie in the streets, as it were, and not know his father, whether God be his father or the devil be his father, for a soul to say, I don't know my father, whether God in Christ be my father, yes or no, this is pitiful indeed. The word father is a sweet word, for it sweetens all our duties. Take the word father out of prayer, and how sour is it? Surely, therefore, it is a sad and sore affliction to lack the assurance of God's love in Christ. But now, although it be a great evil and a sore affliction to lack this assurance, yet I say the saints and people of God have no reason to be cast down or discouraged although they lack the assurance. Well, how would that appear? Thus, if the lack of assurance be not the damning unbelief, then a man has no reason to be quite discouraged, although he lacks assurance. Now, though there may be much unbelief bound up in the lack of assurance, yet I say the bare lack of assurance is not unbelief, not that unbelief that shall damn one's soul to all eternity. Not that unbelief which Christ threatens with damnation. For if you look into John 3.18, you shall find our Savior speaking thus, He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But now, lest any poor soul that would believe and cannot, should be afflicted and troubled at these words, therefore says our Savior Christ in the following words, I will tell you wherein lies the damnableness of unbelief. Verse 19. This is the condemnation. He speaks in relation to the words before. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light lest his deeds should be reproved, or discovered. This light is Christ. Now therefore, do you hate the light? Do you hate Christ? And therefore you keep away from the light, lest your deeds should be discovered? Or rather, on the contrary, do you not now know there are d evil deeds in your life, and much evil in your heart? And do you not know, therefore, that you desire to come to Christ, who is the true light, that your deeds may be discovered? and your sin amended, then though you cannot believe as you would, and though you lack assurance, and though you have much unbelief in you, the Lord Jesus Christ has spoken it, you shall never be condemned to all eternity for this lack. But the Lord Christ will pardon this to you. And therefore certainly upon this account, God's people have no reason for their discouragement. If there be such an overruling hand of grace, and mercy upon the lack of the saint's assurance, is that it shall work to their and to others good, then they have no reason to be quite discouraged, although they lack assurance. As for their own good, by this they do gain experience. 
By this they come to see the emptiness and nothingness of all their own righteousness. David says, you know the scripture. Psalm 116 I said in my haste, all men are liars. The words in the Hebrew may be read, I said in my shaking. I said in my shaking, all men are liars. David was shaken by men, and then he saw that men were liars. So when a man is shaken in his own righteousness, then he sees the emptiness and the lying disposition of it. And I pray, when is a man's own righteousness more shaken than when he lacks assurance of God's love? By this also a man comes to get more and stronger assurance of God's love. That is most certain that is certain after uncertainty. The shaken tree grows the strongest. It is observed of Thomas that of all the apostles he cried out and said, My Lord and my God, two mys, not one my, my Lord and my God. Why? Because he had two no's before. Unless I may put my finger into his side, I will not believe. So you read it. But in the original there were two no's. I will not not believe. A double not. And as there were two no's of unbelief, so there are two my's of faith. So far as a good man is sunk in unbelief, so far he will rise in faith. So much as a man is shaken by unbelief and in a lack of assurance, so much will he rise to assurance and be confirmed and steeled in it. And as for others, a man is never more fit to comfort, to relieve, to satisfy others in their fears, than when he has been in fears and doubting himself. It is a good speech that Maldonado has of Bernard. I would rather believe poor doubting Thomas than confident Peter. I would rather believe poor doubting Thomas and Peter that never doubted. Thomas, having once doubted, knew how to deal with a poor doubting soul. So I say God does order the lack of assurance of his servants to their own and others' good and therefore no reason that they should be cast down and quite discouraged, although they lack assurance for the present. If a man, a gracious man, may have comfort, yea, and live comfortably, although he lacks assurance, then he has no reason to be quite discouraged in case he lacks it. Now, though it may seem a paradox to you, yet you shall find a truth in it. I say a man that has no assurance for the present may have comfort, yea, he may live comfortably if things be rightly ordered. For he that has no assurance may have hope, and hope is comfortable. He that has no assurance may yet rely upon Jesus Christ and stay his soul upon him, and in all reliance there is some comfort. He that has no assurance may be justified and being justified by faith, we have peace with God. He that has no assurance may submit to God's commandments. And the psalmist says, The entrance into thy commandments gives light, and so comfort. In keeping your commandments there is great reward, and so comfort. It is a comfortable thing, Solomon says, to behold the light. And in all light there is some comfort. Now God is light, and the free grace and love of God is light, which a man may behold that has no assurance. You do sometimes take a great deal of contentment in the reading of a story. I do not mean a scripture story, but in other books. I say a man sometimes takes a great deal of contentment in reading of a story, although it does not concern him, for he says, Although the story does not concern me, yet I take complacency and contentment in reading of it, because here I read of the valor of such a man, and of the faithfulness of such a man to his friend, and of the excellent carriages and virtues of men. Now, my beloved, is there no excellency in God himself to content the soul? Is there no faithfulness in God? Is there no love and mercy in God himself? Is not the Lord the God of all consolation, and God of mercy, without relation to my condition? Is there not an ocean of excellent love and grace in God himself? How many sweet stories of love and grace may you read in this little book of the Bible? Besides, a man that has no assurance now, and then may have some promise thrown into his soul, to uphold him with, 
When Elijah was by the brook and could not enjoy the ordinary meat of the land, a raven brought him meat. And whenever was any godly man in such a condition, but he had one raven or other to bring him comfort. Sometimes a temptation is a raven. God makes it so. Sometimes a desertion is a raven. Sometimes affliction. Sometimes a particular word and promise is thrown into his soul. And is there no comfort there? I say, though a man lacks assurance for the present, he may live comfortably. Surely, therefore, a godly man has no reason for his discouragement, though for the present he lacks assurance. But I do not only lack the settled assurance of God's love, and so the ordinary food of the land, but I have no raven to bring me any comfort. I mean I have no promise, no particular word to bring in comfort to my soul, and to uphold me in my dark condition. Though I lack a settled assurance, yet if I had a particular word and promise to uphold my soul, until I had this assurance, I wouldn't be discouraged. But I lack this settled assurance, and I have no particular word or promise to uphold my soul with, until it come, and therefore I am thus discouraged. Have I not reason to be? And I answer, no. For Christian, what particular word or promise would you have? Have you not the whole gospel before you? A bag of golden promises? A father has two children, and he comes to one, and gives to that child a piece of gold. There, child, he says, supply your lack with that. But to the other child, he says, here, child, I know that you are in want, and there are bags of silver and gold in my study. Take the key of my study and go in and take what you will. Is not this latter in as good a condition as a former, or rather better? So it is with the saints. The Lord is pleased to give now and then a particular word to some of his children, but to others he says rather, Here, take the key of faith, for faith is a key, and has a power to unlock all the promises. I give you faith, and by this faith I give you a power to go into all my promises. Is not this latter in as good a condition as the other? So it is, I say, with all the servants of God, having therefore these promises, says the Apostle, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. If the promise of grace belongs to you, then you cannot say, I have no word, no promise to uphold me with. Now, that the promise of grace does belong to you is cleared thus. Number one, your very resting on the promise makes it to belong to you, and it becomes yours by your resting on it. But you do or have rested on the promise. Number two, if the command belongs to you, then why not the promise? Does not the word of commandment belong to you, namely, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery? Does this word of command belong to you? Well, surely, for the commandment says, you, and you, and you shall not, and so on. And that word includes me. The word of promise has its you and thee and they also. Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. Verse 3. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Verse 5. And if you put within yourself the compass of the commandments, you, God will put you within the compass of the promises, you. Number 3. If you may, and it be your duty to rest on the promise, and it belongs to you. Now you may rest on the promise of grace and holiness for sanctification, and it is your duty so to do, else it were no sin not to rest on the promise. But unbelief and not resting on the promise is sin. Only you must know that there is a great difference between the promise of consolation and the promise of sanctification. To apply the promise of comfort without endeavor after holiness is presumption, but to apply the promise of sanctification, that I may be more holy, is not presumption, but my duty, and if it be your duty to apply and rest on this promise, then it belongs to you. Objection. Oh, but yet when I go to the word or to the scripture, I find that God's promises still runs upon some condition, 
and I cannot perform that condition. I do not find that condition in myself, and therefore I fear that I may not go to these promises, and that I have no right to them. But what if a good and gracious man may apply a conditional promise, although he has not performed the condition? Pray. Look into Nehemiah chapter 1, and there you will find that the Jews being in captivity. Nehemiah goes to God in prayer, and presses a promise which God made to the Jews by his servant Moses. Verse 8. Remember, I beseech you, your word and your command, that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast into the uttermost parts of the earth, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them to the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power." The Jews in Babylon were scattered according to the word, but alas, they did not return to the Lord and leave their sins according to the conditions of the promise. Yet notwithstanding, Nehemiah goes to the Lord and presses his promise. And the Lord heard him, and he had acceptance, as you find in the following chapter. What if the condition of one promise be the thing promised in another promise? Will you then fear that the promise doesn't belong to you because you haven't performed the condition of the promise? Now so it is, that the condition of one is a thing promised in another promise. For example, in one promise, repentance is the condition of the promise. Second Chronicles 6, 37 and 38, Joel 2, 15 and 19. But in another promise, repentance is a thing promised. Ezekiel thirty six twenty six. I will take away the heart of stone and give you an heart of flesh. In one promise, faith in coming to Christ is a condition. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. But in another promise, it is the thing promised. John six forty seven. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. In one promise, obedience is the condition of it. Isaiah one nineteen. If you consent and obey, you shall eat of the good of the land. In another promise, it is a thing promised, Ezekiel 36, 2 and 7. I will put my spirit into you and cause you to walk in my ways. In one promise, perseverance is a condition, Matthew 24. He that continues to the end shall be saved. But in another promise, it is a thing promised, Psalm 1, 3. His leaf shall not wither. Ezekiel 36, I will put my fear into your hearts, and you shall not depart from me. In one scripture of the Old Testament, the coming of the Deliverer is promised to the Jews upon condition that they turn from ungodliness. Isaiah 59.24, The Redeemer shall come out of Zion, and unto them that turn from ungodliness in Jacob. But in another scripture in the New Testament, turning Jacob from ungodliness is a thing promised. Romans 2.26 There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and turn ungodliness from Jacob. Now if the condition in one promise be the thing promised in another promise, will you fear that the promise doesn't belong to you, because you have not performed a condition? And again, what if the condition of the promise be performed for you, better than you could perform it? In the beginning the Lord made a covenant with man, a covenant of works, do this and live. And Adam, the first man, stood as a common person for us, all, to perform the condition of doing it. And if Adam had performed the condition, we all had performed the condition. Now the Lord makes a new covenant of grace with man, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the second Adam. And he stands as a common person, and if he perform the condition, then all his seed do perform the condition. Now the Lord Jesus Christ has performed the condition for all his seed. Although the first Adam did not perform the condition for his seed, yet the second Adam has performed the condition of the promise and of the covenant for his seed to the full. Now if all these three things are true, namely that a man may go to the promise, the conditional promise with acceptance, although he's not performed the condition, that the condition of one promise is a thing promised in another promise, that the Lord Jesus Christ has performed the condition of the promise for you better than you can perform it, 
Have you then any reason to be discouraged and to keep off from the promise because you have not performed the condition? But so it is that a child of God may go to a conditional promise with acceptance, although he has not performed the condition. And the condition of one promise is a thing promised in another. And the Lord Jesus, our second Adam, has performed the condition of all the promises for all his seed. Surely, therefore, you have no reason to be discouraged in this respect. But this isn't my case, for I do not only lack assurance of God's love and have no particular promise, but instead of the promise, I have a threatening set upon my soul. Oh, the bitter words of the threatening have soaked into my heart. Time was before this indeed that I had a promise. I could say I had a promise, and I rejoiced in it. But now I have lost my promise, and instead of the promise, a threatening has come. Oh, I feel the smart and the anger of the threatening. And have I not just cause and reason to be discouraged now? No. For if you are drawn to Christ, is it material, whether it be done with a cord of flax or with a cord of silk? God has two arms in which he draws us to himself, the arm of his love and the arm of his anger and justice. The arm of his love is put forth in the promise. The arm of his anger and justice is put forth in the threatening. And with both these he does lift up the fallen sinner. What if God lift you up with his left arm? So, you be lifted up. Sometimes he lifts up with the arm of his threatening that he may carry us in the arm of his promise. For as the law was a schoolmaster to bring to Christ, so the threatening is a schoolmaster to bring us to the promise. Is the threatening therefore come? Then is the promise a coming, for the threatening is given forth in order to that. And if this, which you complain of, may be the condition of the saints, then you have no reason to be discouraged. Now for the loss of the promise, you know how it was with Joshua. The Lord gave Joshua a gracious promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong, be not dismayed, be not afraid. Be of good courage, for I will not leave you nor forsake you. Joshua 1.6 But the children of Israel were a little discomfited by the men of Ai. And see how Joshua lost the sight of the promise in Joshua 7.6. Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads and said, Alas, O Lord God, why would you bring these people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan? Oh, what unbelief is here! What discouragement is here! How had he lost the promise? O oh Lord, he says, what shall I say when Israel turn their backs before their enemies? And oh, what shall we say when Joshua turned his back upon the promise? But so it was with Joshua here. He had lost the sight of the promise which once he had. And as for the threatening, you know how it was with David, having sinned greatly in the manner of Uriah, the Lord threatens him, that the sword should never depart from his house, and the threatening did take hold upon him. And David was under the stroke of the threatening. But was not Joshua godly, and was not David godly? So then a godly man may possibly lose the sight of the promise, and have a threatening set on his soul too. If a promise given out by the Lord shall never be reversed, and a threatening may be repealed, then you have no cause to fear in this respect. Now a threatening is therefore given, that it may not be fulfilled. Jonah knew this so well that he professes to the Lord, that therefore he fled to Tarshish, because he says, O oh Lord, I knew that you were a merciful God. As if he should say, I knew, O oh Lord, you are so merciful a God, that though you have threatened Nineveh, yet you will reverse your threatening. But a promise once given to a soul shall never be reversed or repealed. It may rise up to an oath, as sometimes it does. For when God gives a promise to a soul, an opposition arises, if then God gives out the same promise again, it amounts to an oath. As I live, saith the Lord, I will never reverse this promise that I have made to you. But a promise once given shall never be reversed or repealed, Galatians 3. You have the case that is now before you. Paul says at verse 15, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or adds thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. 
And therefore, says the apostle, the promise shall not be disannulled, although the law came after the promise. But if the promise that the Lord gave to Abraham was not disannulled by the law, that came 430 years after, verse 17, wherefore then serves the law, he tells you, verse 19, it was added because of transgression. So now you say, if that the promise that God has given heretofore be not disannulled and made void by the threatening that follows after, wherefore then was the law or the threatening given to my soul? It was added because of transgression. God had some transgression of yours to discover to you that you did not think of, and therefore the threatening and the law came after. But the promise is quite out of sight, and I have lost it. And did not the Jews also lose the sight of the promise which was given to Abraham? When the Lord gave the law, and they stood trembling and quaking before Mount Sinai, did not they then lose the sight of the promise that was given to Abraham? So I say, although you have lost the sight of the promise that you once had, and the threatening has come in the room of it, the promise that was once given you, it may be 430 days ago or many years ago. It shall never be disannulled or reversed. And the reason is this. Because God does not repent in the matter of the gospel. You read in scripture that God has said sometimes to repent. It repented the Lord that he made man. Sometimes it is said that the Lord does not repent. I am not a man that I should repent. Well, how are these reconciled? God does repent and God does not repent. Thus to our present purpose. God repents as to the matter of the threatening, but God never repents as to the matter of the promise. God repents as to the matter of the threatening, and therefore says the Lord to Jeremiah, I am weary of my repenting. I have threatened and threatened, and I am weary of threatening. Here God repented as to the matter of the threatening, but God never repents as to the matter of the promise. And therefore says the Apostle, Romans 11.29, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, and the promise is a great gift. So then, as to the matter of the promise, God does never repent. Wherefore, poor soul, have you a promise given you, maybe five years ago, maybe ten years ago, twenty years ago, and have you lost the sight of the promise? And instead of the promise, is there a threatening come to your soul that makes your heart quake and tremble? I here tell you from the Lord, the promise that was once given to you, though now you have lost a sight of it, shall never be repealed or recalled. Oh, what manner of encouragement is here? Is here manner of discouragement? No, rather, here is a manner of great encouragement. Oh, but yet this is not my case. I do not only want assurance of God's love, but I have assurance of God's displeasure. I do not only lack assurance of my salvation, but I have assurance of my damnation. I do not only lack the testimony of the Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God, but I have another testimony within my soul bearing witness to me that I am a reprobate. And have I not cause to be discouraged? No, not yet. For it may be you look upon the backside of God's dispensation. If we look upon the face of God's dispensation, we see His love and good pleasure. But if we look on the back side of it, we conclude nothing but anger and displeasure. It may be it is so in your case. But if you find no such testimony of reprobation as you speak of in all the scripture, then you have no reason to fear or to be discouraged in this respect. Now search the scripture, and you shall not find in all the word any ground for such a testimony of reprobation. We read indeed of Francis Spira, notorious for his despair, when his friends came to comfort him, having spake comfortable words to him, that he said, Why go you about to comfort me? Comfort belongs not to me, for I am a reprobate. Oh, said one of his friends, do not say so, for none are able to say so. Yes, said he, as the elect of God have a spirit within them, bearing witness that they are the children of God, so reprobates have another spirit, bearing witness with their spirits that they are not the children of God, but the children of Satan. And such a spirit of reprobation I have. But my beloved, if there be such a spirit or a testimony of reprobation as this is, either it must be from the spirit of God or from the spirit of Satan. If from the spirit of Satan, then he is a liar not to be believed. If it be from the spirit of God, how does it suit with the word? For the spirit of God is called the comforter. 
Can such a spirit of reprobation come from the Comforter? And if you have such a testimony as this is, either you must have it from the Word or from the Spirit of God alone without the Word. If from the Word, then from the threatening. For it is not from the promise, nor from the command. It is from the threatening. A threatening may be repealed, a threatening may be reversed, as you have heard. And if you have it from the Spirit of the Lord, how can it be that the Spirit should be called a comforter? Clearly, therefore, if you have such a spirit of reprobation in your bosom, it is from Satan, and he is a liar. But, my beloved, I will in this appeal to you. Whether you do not think that there is many a soul now in heaven that, whilst he lives, said, I am sure to go to hell? You know that ordinary story of the woman that took a glass in her hand and throwing it on the ground said, As sure as this glass breaks, I shall be damned. But the glass didn't break. Well, then your condition is not alone. Others of God's people may be and have been led in this way of temptation. And therefore, there is no reason why you should be cast down or discouraged. William Bridge, A Lifting Up of the Downcast, 1648.